lot of venture investors had to never invest in Santa Barbara. And the reasoning was life was too good. When the surf's up, everybody goes to the beach and uh, nothing gets done. Uh, since that time, companies like Software.com, Expert City, QAD, Indigo, Sonos, just to mention a few, have proved that, uh, that that's just not right. And uh, I think venture investors and the venture community has a great deal of respect now for uh, our little entrepreneurial ecosystem here. Uh, our sponsors who make all this possible, and believe me, that, that's really important because of the costs of doing this, uh, Riviera Insurance, Bank of the West, Radius Commercial Real Estate, uh, Nassif Hicks, Harris & Company, Public Accountants, Stradling Elka, Carlson & Ralph, Attorneys, Vices LLC for Web and Database Solutions, Pacific Coast Business Times, uh, CIO for Communication Solutions, Express Employment Professionals for uh, Search and, uh, and Employment Consulting. And our supporting sponsors are DuPont Displays, Alma Rosa, which some of you see uh, every time, Mission Ventures from San Diego, and the Newshawk. Uh, once again, as you can see, we're videotaping. This is the 11th of these that we've done. It started about, uh, well, two years ago almost. Uh, they're broadcast on Channel 21 for a month to a month and a half after the event. Uh, so I'd like to introduce Susan Block. She's been a board member for several years, uh, has been an M&A consultant for many years. Um, a few years back, I won't say how long, she was an investment banker at Montgomery Securities in San Francisco. And then uh, some 15 or more years ago, she uh, founded Block Bowman uh, with her partner, Steve Bowen and uh, has been doing uh, all sorts of financial M&A type work here in the Central Coast ever since. Our clients range from, I guess, all over the state of California. Um, so I'd like to introduce Susan, who will be moderating the program and introducing our speakers, etc. Thanks. Thank you, and this is a great turnout, so it's really nice to see everyone. Um, Tonight we have, which is a very interesting and um, timely uh, presentation, which is cloud computing and so software as a service. And there's a great number of startups in this area and a lot of huge market opportunity for if you're not in a, that area, um, even to use the services as a, a user firm. Um, tonight what we have at it to start out with is Klaus um, Schausser, and he is the chief strategist of a company, a local company called Appfolio. Prior to that, he was the CTO and founder of um, Expert City Citrix Online with GoToMyPC and um, GoToMeeting and those types of products. Um, he's got a PhD from the University of um, California, Berkeley, and he's uh, in computer science, and he's faculty at UCSB. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Klaus. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for having me here. Really appreciate that. Um, it's uh, great to have such a great audience. Uh, I think I know almost half of you guys, so it's like speaking to a room full of friends. Um, what I want to do is uh, talk about, you know, this is the title they gave me. I actually don't know who came up with it. Probably Bob, you know, cloud computing and software as a service. But then he put that little tagline down there, 160 billion market opportunity. And uh, that tagline I know wasn't there the very first time when he announced it. <laughs> so maybe he was worried about uh, the turnout. So, uh, <laughs> so uh, suddenly that 160 billion was there and I'm like, I can't believe it's 160 billion. I hadn't heard that statistic before, but um, so uh, turns out there's lots of great statistics out there, and I'll show you later on where he got that number. Was it Bob actually that got the number? Who got it? Or Susan? Susan, there you go. Um, she didn't ask me. She just put the, the number in, you know? So what's cloud computing? Um, I'm sure a lot of you guys uh, want to learn about that and hear about it, you know? Um, you know, here's a simple picture of what cloud computing is. Um, the cloud really represents the internet. And in the past, the internet itself, people have always drawn in this kind of this cloud. It's the cloud that all the computers kind of hook up to and that they use to kind of communicate to one another. 
But with cloud computing, what really has happened is all of those servers now, a lot of them, the services that you're using, live in the cloud. They live on the internet. So for example, if you use Google and you use search Google, you use one of their million computers that they have and they will exit the cloud, exit, execute that search on their computers and return the results back to you. Um, if you use Gmail or Hotmail or any of those products, the data is stored in the cloud and if you actually log in on Yahoo, that data will come back. Um, if you use products like Salesforce, you know, which keep track of uh, um, what, it's like a, the sales pipeline that uh, salespeople use, that data is stored in the cloud. Um, Citrix Align, go to my PC and go to meeting, all those servers sit in the cloud. Um, Amazon um, clearly does all of their computing in the cloud too, but they've recently launched Amazon AWS, Amazon Web Services, um, two products there, specifically Amazon S3, the simple storage service, as well as Amazon EC2, the Elastic Compute Cloud. And what you can do there is you can actually perform computation. You can rent servers out in the cloud. So if you're a young startup and you want to get started and you don't really have the money to buy your own servers, you can just rent for 15 cents an hour a server, or at the low end, actually 8 cents an hour, a server from Amazon, and you can just, that's all you need, 8 cents, and you could start your own company. And that is really amazing, and that's why that's so disruptive. And here in Santa Barbara, there's a whole bunch of other com companies, cloud computing companies. I just listed a couple here on this slide. You know, I'm fully going to learn later. Um, Rightscale, now Michael Crandell, he'll, he sits on the, he's the CEO of Rightscale, is later on the panel. They essentially enable Amazon EC2 and S3. If you actually are going to use it, you actually need to be more of a, not a programmer to actually be able to use it. They have a nice management interface that allows you to very easily put your own computation up there and kind of manage those servers as you launch them. And I'm sure Michael's gonna talk about that later. Not only that, they also allow you to actually not only use Amazon EC2, but all the other services like Rackspace. They, they do more or less the same as Amazon EC2. And you could actually move your computation from Amazon EC2 to Rackspace. And so um, RightScale enables that or you could move it to your own what's called a private cloud. Um, these days, there's a lot of talk about private clouds. There's actually another local company here in Santa Barbara called Eucalyptus Systems uh, out of UCSB uh, by Rich Wolski. And uh, he was also a professor in the computer science department there, uh, like myself. And uh, what they enable is, instead of you having to rent some servers in the public cloud, you can actually run the computation on your own servers. Clearly, you have to buy your own servers, but you can run them the software layer on there, and they implement the same API, the same programming interface that Amazon EC2 and S3 has, and you can have your own massively scalable um, private cloud um, in your own offices or in your own data center. And uh, so that's pretty much kind of an overview of what cloud computing is. Uh, a lot of the cloud computing is really as a service, and from a business model, what you do is you just kind of pay for the service as you go along. You know, you just pay by the hour, um, sometimes you pay by the data, sometimes it's by every month, and uh, there's uh, these uh, business models like uh, Citrix Online, if you use uh, GoToMeeting, you can have as many meetings as you want for $49 a month. But it's like, it's a subscription model, it's like your cell phone, and that's really kind of the underlying business model. Um, so now, as you saw um, or from, from the slide, Santa Barbara happens to have a lot of cloud computing, and I think we're really taking over the world, yeah? Um, yes, I know, you can look out there, that's specifically you know, what we're seeing right now, you know? Actually, uh, let's use the cloud and actually look where we are. We happen to be right here, yeah? And so this is a real-time picture looking outside. Just kidding. Yeah. Good, so this is what I want to do in this presentation. Um, I want to really cover three things. First, give you a little bit more of a detail about cloud computing, about what it is, why it is there, and how big it really is to really kind of answer the 160 billion question that uh, Susan here posed. 
Then I want to talk more about Appfolio, uh, what we're doing right now, um, and our vision, how we acquire customers, the accomplishments we've achieved so far. We have been around only for three years. The team that we've grown, I think you know, that's probably the most amazing part of that company. The team is like awesome. And then, uh, you know, in the summary, there was a little bit about, hey, you should learn something to do your own startup. Um, how many here are really interested in maybe doing their own startup, or how many here are doing a software as a service startup? Great. So I'll I'll help you maybe a little bit. You know, the key takeaways here is uh, do some market validation. You know, uh, hire a great team, leverage the cloud yourself, and then you know, continuously learn by attending events like this. So that's pretty much what I want to cover. Let's start um, with uh, cloud computing itself. Um, so what is it? Well, cloud computing is really the next computing cycle that's happening, you know? And here's the real definition of it. Um, it's a internet-based computing where shared resources, you know, software information and massive scalable IT capabilities are just rented over time. Um, and it's really on demand and it's as a service. And interestingly enough, you can just rent almost anything out there. This presentation that you see here runs off Prezi.com, which they've got a free product. There are some developers back in Hungary that developed this, you know. Uh, but they also, so they need scalable service infrastructure. But uh, it's amazing, it can run off the internet, and so you don't actually have to use PowerPoint to do your presentation. Yeah. Um, so let me just give you a little bit of historical perspective. Uh, back in the 1960s and 1980s, for those of you um, that are you know, um, old enough to remember, um, you know, you really had the mainframe computing. And mainframe was that there was a one big computer in the company, and everybody had like a dumb terminal to really connect to that through the local area network. And, uh, no, that was a low bandwidth because really what you'd exchange was only kind of characters and it was really limited to that building. And then, you know, the whole PC revolution happened and that kind of led to personal computer, led to client server computing. So now you had smart clients, smart computers, but they still wanted to connect back to a central database because very often when you work, you really want to work off the same data. You don't want to have separate databases on each of those computers. And so this is this whole notion of uh, client server computing, it's still based on the LAN, and, and this is a common one. And then, you know, in the last 10 years, this whole notion of internet-based cloud computing really has emerged. And the interesting thing about cloud computing is now is that the terminals themselves can be dumb terminals again. They're not quite as dumb as the original dumb terminals, but they're more like thin clients. Um, so a, a browser is a great terminal. If you have a browser installed, you don't really have to have any local software installed. You can use Salesforce. You can use RightScale. You can use Appfolio. You can use Google. You can use Gmail. You can use Hotmail. It doesn't really matter. If you've got a browser, suddenly all of those IT capability, all of that user interface is opened up to you. And that's very exciting. And so as a result, now, you can also, because browsers kind of go down to smartphones, you know, if you've got an iPhone, you have a browser running. Um, if you've got netbooks, you've got browsers running, you can use it from there too. And uh, so that's uh, very, very exciting. So uh, let me just give you back a little bit of history of how the whole internet started. Uh, some of you probably have already seen this slide, you know. This is my favorite slide. The first four notes of the internet. You know, this is actually drawn from the back of the napkin the ARPANET back then, in December 1969, were four notes. It was UCLA, UC Santa Barbara, Stanford, and Utah. And the main reason why they wanted to connect all of those computers up was that they wanted to get access to the various computers they had. So really, they were doing well, kind of cloud computing back then, right? UCLA had a Sigma 7, Stanford had an IBM 360, Utah had a PDP-10, and they wanted to kind of share those computing resources. Um, and uh, so it's actually you know, very cool that UCSB got, got to participate in that. And the person that actually got that launch at UCSB was Glenn Culler. He was actually the dad of my advisor from Berkeley, David Culler. And David Culler's son, Ethan Culler, now works at Apollo. Isn't the world small? Yeah. 
And you won't believe it, but uh, Rafael Saavedra, one of the founders of Rightskill, is actually living in the house from Glenn Color. So, it's a. So, what's a cloud stack look like? You know, it really has three big components. There's a, at the very top software as a service. Then there is kind of what's called platform as a service, and then there's a infrastructure as a service. And you know, like every good computer scientist, you know, all of these have their abbreviations. So the first one is called. SAS, the next one is called PASS, and the last one is called IAAS, you know? Um. <laughs> okay, so what's software as a service? That's essentially, you no, know, just on-demand SAS subscription-based applications hosted by some vendors and accessed you know, through the internet. So Salesforce, Google, Citrus Line, NetSuite, even game companies like Activision, uh, I'm, I'm sure most of you guys don't play games online, you know, but Farmwell um, or how many play Farmwell? You're the good guys, yeah. Uh, or, or Activision's is uh, World of Warcraft, which you know, they're like huge computing resources, you know, and Farmwell and all those game companies actually use Rightscale for their computing platform. It's just truly amazing. Um, Appfolio. The next level is uh, platform as a service, and that's really more like a development environment where you can kind of put your own computation up and maybe use databases as, as resources. And so uh, Salesforce itself has a product called force.com that allows you to actually do that and implement stuff on top of that. Amazon, we already talked about, Rightscale is really a platform as a service offering because they enable developers to then develop their products on it, like the gaming company Zynga that we talked about. Microsoft felt kind of left out so they launched Azure, yeah? and it's very difficult for existing companies to disrupt themselves. So they're really trying to push it, but I, I see them in the marketplace, and they're just having a hard time with really the acceptance. They're the old guys. They're not the software as a service company. And Google itself does App Engine, where it actually enables now uh, also developers to develop their own offerings. And then at the very bottom layer, you've got infrastructure as a service. So this is really the physical capacity that's really getting rented out for hosting. So it's compute powers, the networks, the storage, and you know Amazon, Akamai, IBM, you know, Eucalyptus, these are some of the companies that kind of enable that. Okay, so how do these data centers look like? This is actually a picture of our one of our own data centers where we're located, so you've got just racks. You know, this actually happens to be one of our persons there. Um, I actually took the, the picture of a cell phone that's not that kosher to take these pictures in those environments. Um, but, you know, these are like rack-based, so there's a whole bunch of servers. You've got like 40 servers in one of those racks. Uh, there are air-conditioned, cooled, UPS power. Um, this is actually Google's. What they're going with now is this notion of they've got a pot. It's essentially a container. So for us, a unit is a like rack. For Google, the unit is a container. <laughs> yeah. um, now, you know, Microsoft didn't want to be outdone. This is Microsoft's new data center in Chicago, yeah? Again, they went with the kind of container model. Um, here is actually one of Microsoft's data centers. Uh, it happens to be at the uh, Columbia River in, in Oregon. It's right next to the river because they want to tap into all the hydraulic power and that's kind of for, for all the cooling. Um, here's uh, another one of uh, Microsoft's uh, data centers. And you know, since Amazon, was so big, I said, oh, I need to find a picture from Amazon's data center. And that turned out to be really, really hard. Michael, you know, I spent an hour looking. Whenever I type in Amazon data center, the pictures that came up were this, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> and then I got that, yeah? And I said, that can't quite be true. Finally, I found this image, yeah? <laughs> turns, out, turns out that one of the primary architects at uh, uh, Werner Vogel said, uh, you know, it was, it was a, hey, we finally support old tapes and old punch cards. You know, it turns out I looked at the date of that blog post, it was April 1, yeah? Um, <laughs> and uh, the one picture that I found was this one, that somebody legally posted something taken off a cell phone. Um, another picture is this one, you know, again, it's like penetrating some things and just driving by without getting caught, yeah? I'm sure Michael has been in one of those data centers, but they probably took his cell phone away, or maybe he has never seen it. You know, I don't know. It's like, I would love to hear that story. Yeah. So these are the only two pictures I could find, and they were like, at the very end of some, some search ranking. So software as a service and cloud computing really is kind of at the, in terms of technology adoption, at is jumping over what's called, it's crossing the chasm. You know, instead of now the early adopters and visionary, now it's really the, 
early majorities that's kind of jumping into it. And this is one area where the consumers have really been ahead. They have just been so much faster adopting it versus uh, businesses. And uh, you know, this is one way to see it, but one way that I always like to see it is, hey, if you get covered by Dilbert, right, then you've made it, right? So the boss you know, says to Dilbert, let's implement cloud computing so I have something to talk about at an executive meeting. And then you know, Dilbert says, tell them we're evaluating it. That way, neither of us need to do any real work, yeah? And uh, you know, the boss says, I like it when you do real work. And they'll go, sorry, I thought you were leading by example. <laughs> but if you really want to see that it's taking off, you know, just look at uh, some of the data that Amazon published. You know, The blue line is Amazon's bandwidth over all of Amazon's shopping sites. So this is the global website that they have. If you browse somewhere on Amazon, you're using their bandwidth. Look at the blue line. The red line is the combined bandwidth for Amazon Web Services. And it's amazing. You know, in 2008, it crossed over. And it's like growing so, so steep. Now, I couldn't find data that was uh, beyond 2008, except, you know, uh, right scale. They, uh, they posted this. And so if you see there, it's like in the middle, it's where 2008 starts. And then look at the growth for 2009. It's still at least doubled, if not more than that. And that is truly, truly amazing. So it's clearly going mainstream. It's clearly, you know, using even more resources than all of Amazon's combined. Yeah. So why is it so big? Well, part of the reasons is that you, know, you can access stuff from anywhere. It's easy to use, and you can connect to mobile devices. So if you look at some chart over time, it's like, this is like years, and kind of, you've got the mainframe, mini computers, PC, cell phones, and then now the mobile smart devices. What happens is that if you look at the number of devices, every time they go up by another factor of 10. So you have 100 million PCs, you've got a billion cell phones, you've got a billion plus mobile smart devices down the road. You know, whether you've got a tablet or, or a sm smartphone or your car, if they really want to function and really talk, they have to talk to the internet. They have to leverage those services that sit on the internet to really be useful. The Kindle without the internet is nothing. The, I, the tablet, you know, iTunes without the internet and the service delivery is nothing. And so what happens is you've got this exponential demand on compute resources on the internet. And as a result, you know, you need extreme flexibility, extreme scalability, and you want to make it very, very efficient. And so these are a whole bunch of reasons why businesses these days, they want to save costs. So they also see the benefits of going towards cloud computing. And a big analogy that uh, this one guy called Nicholas Carr did, he has wrote this book called The Big Switch. And it says, rewiring the world from Edison to Google. And he made this analogy that at the turn of the century, everybody, all the large companies, ran their own power plants. Because if you wanted to use it, there was no reliable power. You had to build your own power plant. Well, these days, hardly anybody runs their own power plant, right? They just plug into the wall. And the same thing is happening with computing. All of the companies these days run their own computers. Well, in the future, they'll just get it off, it's off the wall, you know? And so how big is it? So this is the question now that Susan posed, you know? So I went to the Wall Street Journal um, last year and it says, wow, the internet industry is on the cloud, whatever that may mean. And they say, estimates in fact vary wildly. Research firm IDC predicts cloud computing will reach 42 billion in 2012. It defines the segment as an emerging IT development, deployment, and delivery model enabling real-time delivery of products, services, and solutions over the internet. So, 42. Well, we didn't quite get through to 160. Gartner predicts projects worldwide cloud services revenue will, raise, will rise 23% in 2009 to 56 billion. Oh, that's getting better. Uh, Gartner says it's style of computing where scalable and elastic IT-enabled capabilities are provided as a service to external consumers using internet technology. Its forecast includes online advertising. Huh? That's where a lot of the revenue comes from. Merrill Lynch last year estimated cloud computing revenues would reach 160 billion in 2001. Merrill declined to provide a copy of his report. So that's where we got the number, okay? Now, if you want to dig in a little bit more, you see kind of all these different you know, storage, server, application, infrastructure, and business application. And you just see the red part, which is the business application. It's tremendous what a big part of it and how that is growing. And that's why I, you know, and Apfoli, and all of the investors are so excited about that opportunity. You know? And you say, it still looks huge. 
Well, just look what, in general, is being spent today on IT. If you just look at on-premise IT, today it's like over, it's $350 billion, and only 5% of that is cloud-enabled. If you look, and so that's where the prediction is, you know, it'll grow to $450 billion, and maybe 10% of that will be cloud-enabled, and that's how you get to the $44 billion. So if you look at this, you say, wow, now it looks large, 160 billion, but hey, guess what? They're already spending so much more on just premise-based computing. It is actually not that large. And so you can easily see that all moving to the cloud. And now technology is gonna stick around, but definitely a large fraction will move to the cloud. So now we finally understand cloud computing. And I think you understand now, you know, software as a service, as well as where the 160 billion market opportunity come from. So what I want to do now is tell you a little bit more about Appfolio, you know, about our vision, how we acquire customers, the accomplishments, and kind of the team. Cloud enabled. <laughs> okay, so what's our vision at Appfolio? Well, our vision is big. Really what we want to do is write, run write business software and deliver that to our customers and allow the customers to run their businesses really um, efficient. And all, some of you guys might have heard of Oracle Financial, some of you guys might have heard of SAP. You know, we want to do the same thing as these guys, which is business process management, workflow solutions. But we want to, instead of focusing on large enterprises and instead of focusing on uh, you know, on-premise delivery, we're looking into where the future is going. And so we're focusing only on uh, software as a service, and we're focused only on small and medium businesses. And so we want to develop workflow solutions for various vertical markets and really solve their end-to-end -end business needs. You know, this, they, what they need is they need the same capabilities that large companies have. They want real-time business management solutions so that they see you know, how much money are they collecting, what are their customers doing, what are their employees doing, all of the other stuff. And really, it's a simple vision. You know? If you want to make your office efficient, you better have a paperless office. You better understand your processes. You better have the handoffs from one employee to the next be kind of seamless. And a centralized solution on the web can really enable that and really make you much more efficient. And if you are much more efficient, you are so much more competitive. And see, so we want to offer that as software as a service. It's web-based. You don't need any IT. You just need a browser. You already have it. And again, it just saves you a lot of cost on that front. It's easy to use because it's web based, it's, it's affordable, allows collaboration across all of your employees, no matter where they are, they can work from home, they can work in different offices. The web just immediately enables that. You forget the VPNs, forget all of the other complicated technology that you have. And some of the initial verticals that we looked at are property managers, legal professionals, healthcare and nonprofits. We launched our first product in property management. I'll show you a little bit of detail later on. Right now, we're actually doing a process called market validations. We're looking whether there's a great opportunity in pain and other verticals. And we're looking at legal right now. They've got relatively ancient information systems. They've got client server and desktop uh, programs right now that are really ready to be replaced through some nice, easy to use web-based solution. And we're looking at nonprofit organizations. And a lot of the nonprofit organizations are extremely inefficient. They have a donor management system. They've got an accounting system. They've got um, a constituent management system, and they often enter the same data three times into each of those systems, and they're all inconsistent. No wonder that their overhead is very high. And so they might have some people just entering all the data, and they can't really run all the reports. So that's a great opportunity. We're doing that market validation process. So if you've got, got good contacts to some nonprofits, we'd love to hear that. Um, Jim Semick and John Walker, you know, they're actually doing helping with the market validation. Why didn't you guys stand up here? Yeah, they're actually, you know, if you talk to me afterwards or talk to one of those two guys, you know, and uh, that would be really great. You know, we're trying to learn as much as we can. And really what we learn is whether the pain points and could we solve something. So let, let me first talk about our first vertical, property management now. So we developed this very easy to use web-based solution where, you know, you've got kind of a dashboard of how your company is doing. You've got the properties, the people, um, kind of the accounting and reports. Um, if you click on some of the properties, you kind of see where all of your properties are located. And this shows you part of the power of the web-based solution. You know, we can do a mashup with Google Maps, right? You can zoom into it. You can send directions to this property suddenly uh, to your tenants or to some of the other owners uh, that you're interacting with, yeah? Really what property managers do is they help um, owners of properties rent their properties. 
um, and uh, they collect all the rent. They have to evict the tenant if they don't pay. Um, so for them, uh, you know, keeping track of, of all the money that they collect, um, they do all of the maintenance and then have to pay the maintenance folks. Um, so they want to have an information system that actually keeps track of that. They often manage thousands, thousands of apartments or thousands of homes for doing that. The neat thing about our solution is that all of our reports are very easy, also very easy to customize. It's all central. They don't ha have to worry about database crashings because guess what? They don't run locally. We run it for them, and they are so much faster than, than uh, the desktop solutions out there. Um, now, the other nice thing is that you can use it off um, wireless devices. Now, you can even use it off um, systems like the iPad. You know? So we've got now folks that are using our software on the iPad. We didn't really have to rewrite a single line of code. It's just amazing that they can be in the property, speaking to a potential tenant, processing their, their uh, deposit maybe on the fly right there, uh, and be, you know, maybe emailing them something else, you know, showing what else is available. Uh, it is just really, really, truly amazing. The maintenance guys can use that. Um, the way that we do that is that while we deliver, while we developed uh, the solution for property management, which allows you to kind of keep track of the units, the apartments, the buildings, the tenants, the maintenance, the expenses, the owners, we built this very strong platform um, that ultimately we can use across all of these verticals. So the strong platform have, have all the commerce parts, the accounts, the logins, the workflow engine, the security, but also the emailing and reporting and search, as well as these business logic, like scheduling and, and inventory and accounting, and those are the things that we're doing, and all the web operations. And what uh, we always say is our solution is 100% safe. 100% secure, available, fast, and easy. And the bottom layer really provides you with the security availability and the performance. The top layer provides you with ease of use. So that's why it's very important that the user interface be really easy to use. And it's very important that you really customize the workflow to each of those verticals. Because what we're doing here, the workflow itself wouldn't work for law offices. But if you really think about it, the law offices, they have customers too, right? They do accounting and they need to manage their thing. So it boils down to the same business logic piece. Now they do scheduling, inventory, and accounting, and all those parts. What's actually getting stored in the database is different. The user interface is different, but we can leverage that platform when we go from one verb to the next. And so, how do we acquire the customers? Well, our go-to-market approach is um, we use this great market validation process to identify the most promising verticals, and along with that, a successful market entry strategy. And what we want to do is build the MVP, the minimum viable product that you need to kind of launch with, and then really launch with a big bang. And uh, what we always like to say is when you launch something, when you build that MVP, you better want to have something. It shouldn't be a me too solution. Yes, it should be easy. It should stand out from the truck. And so we use what Seth Godin was like. We try to design a purple cow. Which uh, again takes over the world, yeah, um, in the cloud, and and that purple cow. Our value proposition is this: it's not just the product itself; it's easy to use and secure, and very fast. But it's also the pricing and packaging and how you offer it. So what we try to do is we listen very hard to the market during market validation. We charge for our property management solution one dollar per unit per month. If you own 200 apartments that you manage, it's $200 a month. If it's 1,000 apartments, it's $1,000 a month. It's as simple as that. And that, we always like to say, use it as much as you can because we want your whole organization to use it. Now, even if you've got an on-site manager that needs to use it, it would be great because if they are not using it, you're starting to fax papers back and forth or sending emails. You have double entry. You have different systems. It's much more important that you've got one unified system that everybody in your company uses and you get much more efficient. And we want also, you know, uh, uh, use it as much as you can. For this price, for example, electronic payments, you know, ACH payments, online payments are, are included. So you can go out to all your tenants and say, please pay me via automatic, you know, uh, deposit or withdrawal from your account, the rent, and you have never a late fee. The tenants love it. They don't have to pay anything for it. The property manager love it. They don't have to pay for it. And so what we see is we see tremendous adoption in the usage. And that's something I think 
that really differentiates us. It's like it's all involved. And so really, you know, we can use that for our sales and marketing strategy. Now, initially, we have to use direct sales to really gain reference account. But ultimately, we're going to go online and also leverage online because that's really what we understand. We can offer free trials online and create a frictionless sales model. And really what we will do is we will actually engineer a very easy switch. In the trial, we'll even take your data from your existing system, upload it into our system. You can see that it works. And then, no, in most cases, people actually buy. And uh, we're going to leverage then with no, telesales and complement that it was over the phone support. And the neat thing is because we're a web-based solution, we don't have to send people there and bring a new MySQL server up and do kind of the hard data migration. We can just use GoToMeeting, connect to your desktop, upload your data to the website, run the script, and boom, a couple of hours later, you can see your own data. And we can help you, you know, transition your business. And so that online strategy really involves in having a great web presence. Uh, on that web presence, you clearly want to communicate kind of all of the value that customers are seeing. You know? So this uh, one of our customers, you know, he's saving 40 hours a month using a portfolio to create an email owner statement. This is just one of the examples of how we increased our efficiency with our portfolio. In the past, what people did is they printed out owner statements, a huge stack, then they print all the checks, then they collate it all, they sent. One of our customers used to pay $20,000 a year just in postage. Didn't include the software cost, it was just the postage. What they do right now with us, and they spend two days collating everything. What they do right now is they just press a button, and that sends the owner statements, run all the report, boom, sends it out. And not only that, they can then deposit all of the money electronically into the owner's uh, bank account. And guess what? The owner actually likes it too, because they don't have to deposit the check. The check doesn't get lost. Um, and then, you know, mobile talked about that being very great. And you know the easy data migration. Now, we'll prove that it works. See your data in Upfolio before you buy. Quick, it's automated migration from your current software to Upfolio property manager. And not clearly, when you are in online, you have to use all the online tools. So we have a Facebook. You know, and everybody who wants to be successful better use those tools. You know, so we've got what 482 fans on Facebook. Um, we have uh, Twitter, and I don't know, I don't know. 500 followers on Twitter. Um, so using all of those tools, you know, we have a website called propertymanager.com. It's like the next generation of magazines online where we get a whole bunch of experts to contribute. And you see, there's a little up for you on the side. You know, it's not that we just facilitate the discussion. We facilitate the content. It's not, we're not pushing our product. It's just incidentally that you learn about our product. Because what's happening in marketing these days, it's not about buy, buy, buy. It's more about, are you interested in this? Oh, you want to learn more about something else? You want to learn more about growing your business without spending a small fortune or protecting uh, your relationship or uh, tenant retentions? Those are, those are topics that they're interested in learning about, you know? Um, or how to use social networking to grow your business. Those are all topics that they want. It doesn't talk about Appfolio, actually. Um, and a lot of those articles we don't actually write. Um, we've got a site together with NARPROM Association called greenpropertymanagement.com. You know, again, lots of money savings for them, switching out the old light bulbs with uh, more efficient, uh, uh, go, go pipeless, go green, um, you know, a comprehensive drought tolerant landscape plan. These are all things that property managers really are interested in learning about. So, let me talk to you, tell you a little bit about uh, some of the accomplishments. Uh, the first one that I'm extremely proud of, in 2008, prior to the market crashing, we raised $30 million. And our greatest fan, Tim Bliss, it's, no, I always say he's the smartest investor here in uh, Santa Barbara. Yeah, Tim, why don't you stand up, you know? Um, he's uh, one of the investors, you know? He's with IGSB, the investment group of Santa Barbara, and they were involved in the learning company and Wavefront. And, a lot of other very successful companies. Uh, BV Capital, they were also the first investors in, in Expert City, so really know them and trust them. Cisco, you know, a large company. Um, you might ask, why is Cisco interested in it? Well, they want to learn about software as a service. They, too, realize that is the future, and that's why you know, they're really interested in that. Um, we launched um, a portfolio property manager in June 2008, and you 
saw that we always wanted to launch was a big bang. We want to get mind share after a year. We want to be among the top three. After three years, we want to be revenue among the top three. And so we said, okay, we're going to initially target this single family residence, the small market, because that's really the one that has been left open the most. All of the existing large vendors kind of moved upstream, serves the needs of the REITs, and uh, that's what we did. And so, you know, here's a recent uh, NARPM conference last year. This is NARPM stands for National Association for Residential Property Managers that we attended. Um, you, know, you can see our booth and some of our folks. You know, web-based property management made easy from a portfolio. And the crowd at NARPM, the folks, they voted us actually the NARPM affiliate of the year 2009. That was pretty amazing. And so we've got hundreds of customers who are growing extremely quickly and they love our product. They love the fact that they can just use it from anywhere. And uh, just to show you another impact, uh, RealPage, another big company in the space, they've got $140 million of revenue. They're actually going public right now. And if you look at their S1 um, going public, they say, you know, in the single family market, our ERP, so this is the low end of the market, in the single family market, our ERP systems compete primarily with a folio. That's it. Nobody else is mentioned anymore. So according to RealPage, I guess we're already in the top two, yeah? So, good. So we kind of achieved what we wanted. Really, I say the reason why we did that is because of the team. The team is just so amazing too. And that's really what every startup needs. And what we have is we have a proven team of software as a service leaders, you know? We're responsible for developing, operating, selling, and supporting you know, leading, market leading SaaS products. And you know, go to meeting and go to my PC are used by more than 140 million people annually. It's just truly amazing how many people now, Citrix Online today has seven employees. I'm very proud of the whole team there. They're doing a magnificent job uh, there. And uh, they're growing strong. They have over 300 million in revenue. It's just truly amazing. Uh, our engineering team at Upfolio is also truly amazing. We've developed these great products. Um, and we've got the passion and the proven skills to build really a lasting, uh, profitable company and, and develop uh, products that customers love. And I think that is very important. You know, if you heard, hear about NPS, the Net Promoter Score, you know, that's really what you want to work for. If you've got products that customers love, you will be successful. And so uh, some of the folks, Brian Donahue, you know, he also was, uh, actually was at Citrix Online um, and helped uh, with all the products there. And prior to that, he actually uh, positioned senior position at Stream International, Viacom and Blockbuster. and, and uh, now, he just runs a great organization. I'm very lucky that he actually joined us as, as a CEO. Yeah, um, Myself, you've heard about that before. Um, John Walker, he's the tall guy. He actually founded the company with me. John, why don't you stand up again, you know? He used to play basketball, you know? There's another guy that's very tall. Yeah, I, I, you know, I think you're an inch smaller, though, than John, you know? Um, so, John, you're number one. You're number two, yeah? <laughs> Um, I'm number whatever, 50 here. Yeah. Um, John uh, was involved in a lot of great startups before too, Versora, as well as uh, Miramar here in town that this desktop DNA and PC MacLan and I guess Greg, one of the Miramar founders is here too, yeah. Um, and uh, he uh, also teach software engineering, taught software engineering in Westmont and uh, in computer science and uh, also played basketball in Westmont, yeah. Uh, and then we have a very fortunate for having Karen Ann Platt. She's our CFO. And she actually joined us from Network Hardware Resale. Uh, that, you know, she grew very fast and then was not on the Inc. 500 for four years. Um, and uh, you know, annual revenues of, uh, what, 175 million, it says. Prior to that, she was actually CFO at Sansom Medical Foundation. So it's very cool to have her experience there. And then we've got you know, marketing folks and uh, client services folks and product management, all of these functions are very important. Marketing, folks that really understand that. And you know, finally, Bill Evick, Evick he's the guy that um, joined us at the beginning of this year. He had just tremendous background in, in property management and was actually a, a director at uh, Rent Payments, you know, one of the largest electronic payments in the, in the multifamily industry. And before that, he was actually at MRI, one of the also leading uh, software solutions for that. So without that team, no, we couldn't have had done it. You know, and the way that we do it, we run an agile software engineering process, and that's something that you find a lot of software as a service companies are doing. 
agile really means is that instead of having this waterfall model where you define everything up front and then you take a year to build it and then you launch it, you just launch in monthly increments. And the reason why that's important is because you get feedback from the users. You can see what the users are actually doing on the site and you can learn from that. And so you want to be able to just launch in small, small increments. And the other thing that we do, you know, half of the team are technical, half of the team are you know, kind of sales and marketing and, and really know the market. You really want to get the engineers involved talking to the customers, really learning all the pain points and learning how to solve it. You cannot just have an engineering department that just sits on the, on the side. The other thing we do is we do pair programming. Now you see engineers working together. You say, hey, well, that squanders resources, right? You're just uh, halving your productivity right there. No, it actually doesn't because folks get to talk to each other. They really, if you say, you know, implement this to one engineer, they will implement what they think was what you asked for. And uh, if you have two, there's some discussion and they will actually implement something better than each of them alone will. Actually, it's Shonda Krenz from the computer science department looking in because she's also very interested in maybe taking that onto the, back to the university for kind of teaching, yeah, which I think is interesting. You see John kind of now working with some folks there and we actually have some folks remote. Remote doesn't matter. No, we can use uh, Skype, we can use uh, GoToMeeting, we can use all these tools to collaborate together. You know? uh, showing something, you know? Um, and uh, you know, they demoing something here and you can see Albert, our salesperson there in the middle, he's like, oh, this is so cool, you know? Yeah, he gets really excited about that, you know? Um, they, we do kind of stand up meetings every morning where we're talking about very briefly what's the status to make sure everybody's uh, in sync. And on the side there, you can see we're projecting a burnout chart. It's where are we on this month's sprint? You know, so we've got monthly sprint. And then at the end of every sprint, we do what's called a retrospective. We say, hey, what went well? What didn't go well? What can we improve? So it's not that we just defined top down, this is the process. No, but what's happening is the engineers themselves improve the process. And this is a methodology that's so great because this is really adaptive learning. Um, and that's actually something that we're also applying throughout the rest of the organization. Okay, then we also have fun once in a while, you know. Um, this is when down the, uh, was a team building event, the Kern River. And uh, now focus on that guy that sits there in the middle, you know. He was one of our interns. Uh, <laughs> You know, this is the picture, you know, his head is already under, look at that, yeah. Um, this is a second later, the paddle's up there, the guy's gone, yeah. Um, fortunately, you see the helmet pops back up, he still can't breathe, you know. He gets uh, one quick breath and then goes down the rest of the, the stream, you know. Finally, we fish him out at the end. Um, you know, we celebrate, but ultimately we decided not to hire him, yeah. <laughs> Um, you know, a lot of folks, we play Wii games, a whole bunch of other things with com competitions all the time. You know, it's just a very great kind of software engineering environment. And we also have external speakers. This person actually happens to be David Heinemeyer Hansen. He's actually the inventor of uh, Ruby on Rails. You know, it's a great framework that lots of folks are using. And it's just an amazing speaker, an amazing engineer. Yeah. So, good. I talked to you about... Um, really a portfolio. Now I want to spend a couple of minutes uh, telling you about now your own startup. Um, you know, and what could you do? Or maybe you're invested in some of the startup, now software service. How do you make it successful? You know? And here's actually a, a, a comic that I saw when I actually launched Expert City in 1996 you know, from the Silicon. Um, this is the San Francisco Chronicles from Laurel LeMay, how to form your own, very own Silicon Valley startup. And so you know, I just thought, this is easy. You know, one, two, three. So, Step number one, you know, you go to Menlo Park, you find a tree. Step number two, you shake the tree, your venture capitalist will fall out. Step number three, before the venture capitalist regains his wits, you recite the following incantation. Internet, electronic commerce, distributed enterprise-enabled applications, Java. <laughs> that clearly is not gonna work today anymore. So what would it be today? Cloud computing, what else? SaaS, what else? Ruby on Rails, you guys are geniuses, yes. So that's what I updated, cloud computing, SaaS, pass. You know, I left the I away. Alternative energy, nano, web 5.0, you know. Um, nano, Ruby, and uh, you know, step number four, the venture capitalist will give you $4 million. Step number five, in 18 months you go public. 
Step number six, after you receive the check, you go back to Menlo Park, you find a tree. And step number seven, you climb it and you wait. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's not quite as simple as that. And you know, we learned it the very hard way. You know? And so my first advice to anybody that really wants to do something, it doesn't really matter whether it's software as a service or some other company, is do market validation. Make sure that you've got customers that are actually willing to pay for your product. And we learned it the hard way. Um, you know, this is a local guy called Frank Robinson that actually developed that methodology, and you know, Tim Bliss and his team have been working for him and for a long, long, long time. Really the way that uh, Frank likes to say it, instead of not what most people like to do, I design something, I build it, I sell it, turn it upside down. First sell, then design, and then build it. And you say, wow, I don't have anything. Well, yes, you can sell a feature list, you can do some PowerPoints, you can do it very easily. And a guy that actually summarizes quite nicely in a book is Stephen Blank, uh, it's called The Four Steps to Epiphany. You know? So read that if you want to do a successful company. And the way that he calls it is acquire these early evangelist companies, and really what you're doing is you get to hear the bad news up front. If you just design something, you will hear some bad news. And you can hear it at the point where you can still react to it, and all it does is maximizes the chances of a successful product. So it doesn't guarantee it, but it maximizes it. And so really follow this if you want to do your own successful startup. The good news is that most companies are actually very bad at following this. They're just so poor. So you've got, just by following this process, a huge leg up. And so that's why I'm such a strong believer in it. And I would go a step further. If we hadn't done it, we would not have raised the $30 million. We raised the $30 million off market evaluation. Clearly the team and other things were also important, but that was a big component of it. Um, the next one is hire a great team. You know, I would actually go a step further. Hire a great flexible team because what you think you're going to do is not quite what you will do. So you need the people that kind of adjust through that whole process. You know, and uh, the next one, and this is specifically for software service, leverage the cloud. It makes no sense for you to buy your own servers. You know, you want you know leverage RightGill, Amazon EC2, S3. Just go as you buy. If you then grow and become widely successful at that point, you can uh, maybe buy your own servers. You know, leverage open source, Ruby on Rails, Ajax, Web 2.0, Apache. There's lots of things. You know, have an agile software development process. You now with with Scrum. And the other nice thing that you can leverage, and this is something that we leverage, is the market has already been educated about the value of software. All we do is reinvent the software and make it nicer, easier to use, and change the pricing model. And that is so exciting. And then. The last thing is learning, and I think you're already doing the right stuff. Is you now going network, attend events like this, read books. No, especially if you read something the Bessemer Laws. You know, if, if you want to do Bessemer Laws, top ten laws of cloud computing and software as a service. You know, running an on-demand company means abandoning many of the long-held tenets of software best practices and adhering to these new principles. So read this. This is very valuable. And uh, yeah, there's another great book called The Art of the Start that really, you know, it's a how to really launch your thing, another one of the things. And then there's lots of resources online. Read blogs, like Stephen Blank, the author of The Four Steps of Epiphany, has a, has a blog that he publishes all the time with his experience. Eric Ries, you know, one of the guys that worked this, they together run this, what they call Lean Startup Movement, so their startuplessons.com, where you can see with a very small amount of money, you can actually iterate very fast. And as long as you iterate and you'll learn, you will be successful, and that's part of, of the value that you have. You know, you might start off with something that's not successful, but as long as you can pivot and then kind of refocus with the feedback that you get, that is very, very important. Okay, so this is pretty much my, my um, do market validation, hire a great team, leverage the clouds, and learn, continuously learn. Okay, so let me just summarize. Now, we're extremely excited at Upfolio about what we're doing, and uh, you know, great companies actually saw this transition happening early on. Um, Bill Gates and Ray Ossie at Microsoft, they wrote this very famous memo called the Internet Service Disruption. They saw this coming. They said, you know, this will happen, both for consumer as well as business products. We're actually very proud because go to my PC and go to meeting were both mentioned in that report, and that was like maybe five years ago or six years ago that they published that, yeah? It's very hard for them to change their own company. Cloud computing, as you saw today, will be huge. It's creating exciting opportunities across all businesses, and that's why we are so excited about it. 
it's a business software. The opportunity is huge. All small and medium businesses, you know, even hair salons, if they're not using software today, they're still using paper and pencil, a lot of them, they will be using software in 10 years because if they don't, they will be out of business. Now, it, that's what they need to make them more efficient. And they will use this workflow software, these business process management solutions, because that gives them the efficiency and gives them the view and seeing where the customers are actually spending the money and everything else. And all of the statistics that you saw, you know, IDC, Gartner, Merrill Lynch say this is the next huge opportunity, you know, $160 billion. And that small and medium business is still quite untapped, and that's where we are actually going after. Now, we've got the team that can actually ex execute on this. Now, we've successfully sold software as a service products to small and medium business, which is very hard to do, by the way, yeah? We've got the smart talent team that can actually build, operate, sell, and support scalable internet services. And that whole combination is the thing that uh, will make us successful. So, you know, just like cloud computing, and just like RightScale and all the other companies, you know, Appfolio will be big. But what we're doing is that we're focusing only on business management, software as a service. Um, our goal really is to become the SAP, but for small and medium businesses, really focus only on software as a service and only make it a lot easier. You know, SAP is really, really complicated. Yeah? We want to just create a solid long-term company. And you know, since you guys are all here, um, I might just as well do a little bit of recruiting here. Yeah, we're always looking for great talent. Yeah? Um, you know, and maybe there's no opportunity today or tomorrow, because whatever, you're, we just don't have the need. But since we're growing, you know, we're over 60 people now already. Yeah, um, I know there's a lot of other great companies in town, like Right Skill, that are also growing. So we're always looking for great talent. Um, and also, what I said before, is if you um, have great connections with nonprofits and we see that they are run if inefficiently, you know, we'd love to talk to you guys. OK, so let me just summarize. It's time for cloud computing is now. And then I finally leave you for those guys that actually want to do a startup. You know, a little quote from Albert Einstein, vision without execution is hallucination. Okay, well, thanks so much. Thank you. So um, now what we're going to do is bring the panelists up. And we have, besides Klaus, we have Michael Crandell, and he's the founder and CEO of RightScale. And he has had history with several other software as a service companies, and I also remember him from EFAX. Um, and then we also have Reed Sheard, who's presently the chief information officer for Westmont and doing a cloud computing installation there. And lastly, we have Lonnie Wills, and Lonnie is the founder and president of a company called Cloud Trigger that does a lot of installation and consulting in the cloud space. So um, I have a, and thank you all for being here. Um, I have a question or two for each one, and then I'm going to open it up to the, the group for questions. Um, I want to start with uh, Michael Crandell. And one question I have, Michael, is how open source fits into this. Um, does the cloud rely on op open source? Does, is, you know, has the cloud affected the whole concept of open source? Open source has driven much of cloud computing. So if you look at, uh, in the earlier days, what's, what Google operates off of, mostly open source, mostly Linux-based, same thing that took hold in the early days, uh, infrastructure as a service at Amazon Web Services. That's starting to change over time because the fundamental idea of using cloud computing resources somewhere else also works with closed source and, and proprietary software. You can run Windows there. It costs more. It becomes very evident what the tax is to run Windows in the cloud versus running Linux. Uh, it's about two and a half cents per hour on an eight and a half cent instance. Uh, but much of it has been driven by open source. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a question for Lonnie. So one of the things that I'm looking at Klaus's iPad, um, how, do, how does iPad and the whole mobility fit into the cloud space? Yeah, it's, it's really quite interesting. Um, you know, the iPad was what, released four or five weeks ago. And um, we already have uh, several clients that have asked us to help build applications around their environment using salesforce.com as a solution and delivering that uh, worldwide. And so, um, 
it, it, it creates a, a different space. I mean, I think some people think, well, it's a toy, it's something that, that's unique, or it's just not something you use in business. But, but I've been down the road for the last four weeks, um, and I've used it exclusively as, as, a, as a tool for me in my business. I can actually help write reports, do things in salesforce.com, uh, look at my business financials, uh, all those things that are important for me as a president of the company. But you take that down to a user that's, uh, you know, you think about today, what's happening uh, right now, uh, you go to a store somewhere, a restaurant, and they're writing some receipt. Uh, you can see that in the future, having an iPad, and, and then they're swiping a the credit card, and they're off and going. So I, I definitely see a lot, of, uh, a lot of interesting ideas coming about. We're building some, building some really exciting applications for some uh, interesting companies uh, uh, in the, in the, all, or, or all around the country. So uh, excited to see where that's going. Okay, thank you. Um, and Reed, for you, because my understanding is you're working on the, the installation at Westmont, what, what would you give as reasons for a CIO of a company now to be um, switching over or con changing to computing, um, to cloud computing? That's a great question. I think uh, where Westmont might differ from the companies that uh, Klaus was talking about is uh, we're, a, we're a business that's 80 years old. Um, we're in Santa Barbara where it's tough to recruit even if you had money. Um, a significant economic downturn, um, three budget cuts and salary freeze and a hiring freeze and going on our second year. I think you look at small and medium business that's been around for a while, it's kind of the reality that many, many companies are in. And I used to work for Apple, and I remember when uh, Apple went through their tough times in the late 90s, and I was there and meeting with my boss and said, well, how are you going to go after the next quarter? What are you going to do? And my answer was, I'm just going to work harder. Uh, and it was a little more sophisticated than that, but uh, he ended up saying, you know, that's really the classic definition of insanity. Um, our business is in complete turmoil right now. You really got to think disruptively. You got to do something different. You can't do better at what you're already doing. And when I look at Westmont, uh, Westmont ac academic reputation, if you're not in the, the higher ed business, uh, all the schools are ranked around the country. In the liberal arts um, category, Westmont ranks in the top 100 schools in the US. Uh, academically, it's had a good 20 year run in that space. IT has not kept up. And when I was hired, uh, we're finding that technology is really, if you're looking at when the student goes to pick a school, where is your school, What's your? do you have the major I'm interested in or the program, the next one on the list is technology ahead of cost. And it was really critical that we had to get kind of IT or technology aligned with where the college was going. Well, I've got a great team, but it wasn't a team that was necessarily succeeding. So we looked at cloud computing really as an opportunity to take a number of things that we were doing in-house and to move them out, to really go to something that's disruptive. It's much easier to not manage a system than it is to manage a system. Uh, there's a lot of things that we don't do anymore, and uh, we were able to start and deploy 12 uh, huge cloud projects in a 12-month period with no additional headcount and no additional budget, in fact, three budget cuts. Uh, and I think if you had the right team, we just really needed a disruptive strategy. And so it's incredibly practical for us, cloud computing. It isn't just some ethereal idea that's out there. It'd be kind of fun to mess around with. Uh, it's something that we've needed to do. It's kind of core to what the college is going to be about, particularly as IT is now strategic, not just tactical. Okay, thank you. And my last question is for Klaus. When you lay awake at night, either worried or excited about a great idea, what is that that you're thinking about? Um, at this point, I'm more excited than worried. Um, good. That's good news. Originally, I was uh, worried about uh, you know getting the funding and the people and you know, just the vision I think we had, you know. Um, and really, what I'm excited about is the big opportunity. And so. My challenge at this point is, um, and the way that I like to phrase it, we have to kind of do a startup within a startup. I think our first vertical is a great choice that's really running extremely well, and it's like running. Um, what we need to think about is what is the next vertical to go, go after, you know? And so that's really, you know, we're really looking at that very intensely, but fortunately we've got that market validation process, and we're just gonna talk to lots of folks, and 
Once we hear that pain, we get extremely excited, and that keeps me awake. Okay. So other people's pain keeps me awake. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Better than your own. <laughs> so I'd like to open it up now to questions from the audience. What are the main objections that you hear from potential customers, uh, you know, the top three objections to why people don't want to do this? I think most of those objections that we hear or heard in the past centered around control. It's control of the data, control of the um, compute cycles. Um, it's also, you know, very much like, hey, you know, you're taking my job away. I'm the one that's in charge of IT. You know, it's like, so with uh, go to IPC and go to meeting, we heard a lot about that. I want the premise-based solutions of your products. You know? I am worried about security and my data leaking. Um, and it, back then, it just took us very, very strict focus of saying, no, unfortunately, that's not an option. We are a software as a service company, and you can't have it. And so I had to say no a lot. At the, uh, really, what I learned there, the smart way, uh, the hard way, ultimately, is don't say no. Say, yes, you can have it. It just costs you a million dollars. You know? And really the analogy is that, well, you want this race car with a driver and chauffeur and mechanic? Well, you can have it. It costs you a million dollars, right? Or just want to buy the car that we you know it's, it's we drive it for you, right? And uh, so I think, you know, that that is those are the biggest concerns that people express. Now, the, in, in response to that is, uh, and, and property managers, most of them have really gotten over it. I think most of them really see the value of being able to do web-based access. And uh, that, that's really a market that's really ripe for the picking. And that's really what you have to focus on. Lawyers, we hear a little bit more pushback, you know? Um, and so you really, the way that I view it, you have to pick the market that's ready to just jump over that, you know, across the, the, the chasm, you know? That's really what you want to do. And the way that you address that concern is you say, okay, great, well, you run your own service today. Wonderful, great. Um, what, do you have uh, alarm-proof uh, windows? What if somebody breaks into your office? You're gonna lose it. What, do you have laptops? You know, the CEO of HP lost his laptop at a conference. He was giving a presentation like me, afterwards he talking to lots of people. Somebody walked away with a laptop with all the data on there. Um, the people lose that, it's like, well, you know, if, if one of our customers uses their iPad or any other device, it's like, no data lost. If somebody breaks into your office, no data lost. So there's disadvantages with every solution, no matter what you have, right? The only security is not you know, just memorize everything. I guess in the future, probably somebody can extract that too, but right now it's not. And that, for most businesses, is just not an option. So, so really kind of weighing this, and, and what you want to do is you want to go after those opportunities where they're really ready to embrace it. Plus, I'd like to add to that a little bit too, as we work with Fortune 500 companies, a big thing that comes up is security. And people think about their data in the cloud and is it secure. And uh, what we find is, is that, and I'm sure that you, you found this as well, is that uh, we're probably more secure in the cloud for the mm -hmm. same reasons that you just pointed out. Um, the data is not here locally. I'm in my Salesforce instance, I'm in my financial system, but it's in the cloud, it's secure. It's, it's uh, if you've got my iPad or my laptop, you can't get access to that information. So. Um, and the types of things that they've done around security, I think, have made a huge difference. And uh, you know, we think about online banking today and so forth. But that's another big area where we see clients come up in every, almost every engagement. Well, is it secure? Um, is it protected? How do we how do we know that? Is the data backed up? All those kind of things that we deal with on the IT side, but they're they're clearly uh, not not a worry now. It's focused on the business, how the business operates, and not dealing with those types of infrastructure questions that you deal with on a day to day in a client server based world. And, and we can even probably say, and I'm sure right folks can, the right scale and those folks can say the same thing, is that we actually tend to do a better job because we're really focused on that security and the availability. And you know what, if an uh, earthquake um, hits your building, well, where's business continuity? You know, you move, what, well, you just lost your servers or a fire, right? Um, we offer that, that's by nature. We can fall over to other disaster recovery data centers and stuff like that. So that's a, um, so you know, one of the biggest, I think the biggest single yeah. obstacle is security. It's raised over and over again. And the interesting thing, though, about the whole market validation uh, and, and market development pattern is that while it sounds simple and you say, here's where we are in the curve and we're about to cross this chasm, when you speak with prospects, they're not all in that narrow slice. You're talking with people up at the top, over on the right-hand side. That's that's a, a graph that measures time. But some of the people who are over on the right-hand side two, three years from now, 
you're talking to today. And you need to, so part of that process is teasing out and interpreting what the, the thinking is on, on the part of the people that you're talking with at the time you're talking with them. I remember being in a conference room full of folks, and, I, and in the early days of Wrightscale, I was just so fired up. You see how fired up Klaus is and Lonnie, and there's so much excitement. This is disruptive. And I looked around this committee of people at their faces, and they were all these long faces. And it suddenly occurred to me, I'm talking about disrupting their jobs. And it's not so exciting to them. <laughs> and and you know, it was going over like a lead balloon, and I finally realized it was just the wrong, that was the wrong audience uh, for what we were talking about at that time. And you often have people, you know, I think use security and control as an excuse for inertia. They're just not ready. They don't want to make this move right now. What's an easy reason to give? Nobody's going to say, we don't like change or we don't want to evolve. It's, oh, it's not secure enough. So there is, I think there's some uh, interpretation that has to go on in the process, which is what makes it interesting uh, and fun. Okay. Another question? I was curious if uh, Force.com and uh, the Google App Store uh, are the ability to, for a lot of people to create apps up there an enabler, a validator, or is it something that you're very worried about very quickly diminishing your business value? I, I think it's an enabler for lots of startups. You know, you've got a platform that's very powerful that you can uh, quickly develop applications yourself without having to, you know, put the whole infrastructure in place. You know, so App Engine, Google Force, uh, there's lots of other companies that are developing these, uh, and uh, I think that's really, really good. Um, so I think it's uh, exciting for, for startups that are, are leveraging this, you know. Um. I would say, too, that um, it's a huge enabler. Uh, if we look again at Westmont, maybe as a small ecosystem of what uh, the larger reality is, a year ago, February 2009, we had 42 iPhones or um, smartphones on our network at the college. Uh, I took a survey before the Board of Trustees came about a week ago, and that number in a 13-month period, it went to 720. Uh, and so the Westmont, by moving to some of the, these uh, apps that are uh, in the cloud, we were able to spend time building ahead of that what was going to be coming. I mean, no one two years ago or a year and a half ago what didn't realize that this whole space was going to be huge. The issue was there's no time to work on it. You know, if I look at my staff, January 1st, we've spent 95% of our money and have deployed 100% of our time on things that are boring. That, uh, and so this whole issue of change, it is absolutely real. But when you sat down and said, well, what are you worried about giving up? It is all, you know, it's the patch updates and this and that, all the things that they really, the uptime, the, the mechanical part of, of running a, a good IT shop. And as we were able to push some of that stuff out, all of a sudden, the inventive site, the innovation, all the, to look up and look out about what would be, what would matter for our institution. We finally had a little bit of time to actually do that. And then these mobile spaces, the cost to entry is so low and distribution is so seamless that a place like Westmont could suddenly get in the game and deploy an application worldwide at virtually no cost to the institution other than having to build the app. And that's, a, I think, a really good thing for small and medium-sized businesses uh, all over the place. And that's why there's been this huge movement towards it. Yep. The issue is finding time. No, I, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, that's what we do, and uh, we work with small companies, with the large companies, and uh, I give you a couple of data points. Um, work for a, a large search engine company, and uh, doing work for them, and they uh, came to us on a Thursday, and said, um, "Hey, we want to deploy this application in three countries, three different languages, uh, on Monday. Uh, it wants to, we want it on a mobile platform, and of course, it has to support those three languages." And uh, we wrote it in about six hours, tested it, and deployed it on Monday in Japan, um, the U.S., and then uh, in another country, uh, well, China, and then and also Australia. But, but the point is, is that we built this thing so quickly, and it enabled uh, hundreds of people to do the work that they need to do, and do the training, and go out and, and do that work. Um, that's one example. We we recently wrote a solution for a, a large publishing company, um, working with several CIOs in this organization. 
and um, they had said, hey, look, there's no way you can deploy Salesforce in our, in our space in a year. It'll just take too long. Well, we roll it out in uh, 18 markets in about, uh, f- about four months, uh, including training for the entire team. And so Salesforce and Force.com is an enabler because I'm able to focus on the business process. If you think about any of these applications that I have to go build from scratch, I have to go buy the servers, I have to go buy the software, I could spend three, six months just in the procurement process validating the technology that I'm going to put that on, the data centers, the disaster recovery, the security, all that stuff goes away. Now I'm focused on enabling the company around their business and what processes make them successful. And so we're able to quickly deliver those solutions for them and they're up and running, their sales increase almost overnight. Um, it's a very, very powerful tool and enabler for companies, you know, medium and, and, and large business as well. Okay. Thank you. Next question. Yes. Um, one of your slides, uh, Klaus, showed that you're looking into healthcare, nonprofits, done property management. What process do you use prior to market validation to identify the market opportunity? Um, you know, I just try to meet as many people as I can always for lunches or different verticals. Um, when I, wherever I go, you know, I go to the dentist, I go to the doctor, I go, are you happy with your existing system? I look at it, I say, <laughs> you know what, you got the reminder wrong. Yeah, um, I, I just look for pain now, you know, I actually carry a little pain meter around, you know? <laughs> okay, high pain. Uh, no, just, <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, it's, a, it's really, you know, you look through yellow pages in terms of what businesses are out there, you know? And, and uh, what we do is we do a lot of brainstorming within our organization. Oh, flower shops, wow, that came up. Uh, that's, uh, uh, it's, it's a, they, they need software too, right? And, and so then, you, but you really, it's, it's going back to kind of that analogy that, you know, you want to have a tree full of opportunities, and, and what you want to identify somehow is the one that's the lowest hanging fruit, you know, and that means the pain is the highest. Yeah? And uh, and also the one that's the ripest, because, yeah, it might be low hanging in terms of, you know, what to, to implement it, but if they're not ready to embrace it, like, you know, beauty salons was doing an online calendaring or something like that, they just don't seem to be able to, um, then that's not a, a good solution. Yeah? And so just keeping your ears out there and and also looking, you know, we're looking at list of all, um, you know, software companies that are just doing business their traditional way, and just try to interview lots of lots of uh, customers that and say, oh, these are guys ready for disruption. Yeah. We looked at healthcare. Healthcare is very exciting. It's a great market. Uh, we actually attended. We, we go you know, go to trade shows too. Uh, so we went to some. Jim actually went to uh, um, a trade show and. And you know, we learned there, interesting enough, you know, there's a thousand companies focused on healthcare. A thousand startups, you know. And then there's all the big guys like IBM and everybody else in their HP, and it's a huge opportunity. Clearly it is, right? But people have been trying to do electronic medical records for the last twenty years, you know, it's like doctors don't seem to be embracing it. It's like are we going to compete against an IBM or an SAP or anything else? Probably not. Yeah, and so that's why we decided. You saw it on my list. You know, for the VC pitches was on there, but um, once we got into it, we're like, oh, that's probably too crowded of a space. Yeah. Plus, the MIT Forum reservation system is causing some pain earlier this evening. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's a great thing. So you know, maybe there's pain. Maybe they're aware that they have a pain. Have they been actively looking for a solution? And then the last thing, do they have a budget to buy the solution? And <laughs> probably the last one would be, the answer would be no. So therefore, we do want to be a for-profit organization, not a non-profit organization. <laughs> Can you turn me on? Right. But one of your verticals was non-profits that you're looking at. Yes. So how do you decide if they have enough money? Oh, that's a good one. They're actually spending a lot of money today on both information system, but also on employees doing double and triple entry. So it's it's not that they're not spending the money. They are actually spending the money, you know? And the way that you see it is you look at their statistic and say, you know, maybe they get a you know, million dollars in as a nonprofit and they have 25% on overhead, right? So they spent $250,000 on overhead. And, and uh, that's overhead. It's not like goes towards services, right? So only a quarter, and some, some nonprofits are even worse than that, right? Uh, you know, they, you've got what? You donate and 50% just disappears yeah, in overhead, right? And so 
So really focus on that overhead because they themselves also want to, they're doing, most nonprofits are doing amazing work, right? And really what you want to do is you want to enable them to do even more amazing work or get the even more amazing funding in um, without uh, really wasting it on overhead. And they themselves are also very motivated of doing that. Question for the panel, my name is Ron Lawton. A couple years ago, I ran a very large data warehouse project. We looked into cloud computing, but the data storage requirements over 20 terabytes just weren't right for the vendors where they were at at the time. Have, in the last two years, uh, cloud computing vendors expanded into large storage solutions? I'll take a shot at that. Um, I think basically, yes, it would, if you were doing that today, it'd be worth revisiting. The, the issue isn't so much about the storage or the type of storage, it's getting the data in and out. Uh, and Amazon S3 uh, adopted a new system, I think sometime in the last year, the sort of ship us your hard disk system, as opposed to try and pipe it over the internet to get it up there. When you're talking about data sizes in those ranges, it's, it would takes a long, long time to pipe it over the internet. So you can get it up there. If you need it going up and down in those sizes frequently, that's an issue. That's a real issue for cloud. But if you can get up up there once or build it up there over time, um, absolutely, I think it's a good solution. Yeah, I'll just I'll make a comment on it as well. So we partner with a small company called IBM, and and uh, they're doing some really amazing stuff. Uh, and it's interesting. I, I met with a couple of uh, executives uh, over the last six months talking about where they are in the cloud and what are they doing. And they had some recent announcements that interrupt about where they're at in the cloud. They've got their own kind of cloud computing space now, they're kind of behind the curve a little bit there. But one of the things that they have been doing that I think is really exciting is they've been working with Amazon, and they now have a full IBM stack on, it's called IBM AWS. And so imagine being able to use all those IBM solutions and platform on AWS. And so you want to do a data warehouse, you've got DB2, uh, you can launch and build a whole data warehouse on that platform. And so um, it's, a, it's a very, uh, I, they're obviously pioneers in that space. Um, uh, around IBM because it's a different model for them, but uh, but I think it's exciting um, and uh, and it's given us some interesting ideas around opportunities. You know, start thinking about data warehousing. Every client we work with has an issue around data, data storage, data warehousing, analytics, and so I can see in the future products around that where there's that ability to do that backup, whether they're using that Folio or, or, or right scale, and they want to have data backed up, they could use that as a secondary solution and then build an analytic tool around that and then really start to see what's happening with their, with their information over time. We moved um, our email store to um, acquisition of Google Postini, uh, 1.7 terabytes, um, probably about 3% of the cost of doing it internal. The effect of Westmont, uh, we were at, at Purchased a SAN. It was one of the uh, pieces of infrastructure we decided to do. It filled up almost immediately because it was just pent up demand for enterprise storage. Uh, by moving 1.7 terabytes off and into Postini's cloud with a 10 year contract for archiving, I freed that up and it, it's going to delay any investment into that SAN probably three or four years. That's itsy bitsy stuff, you know, it's not um, the 20 terabytes. Okay. My name is Karen Edwards, and I have a question for the panel regarding business models. Now, Klaus was saying that the uh, first model is around the subscription where you're subscribing to the end users and you're trying to build the demand. If you are then providing a value added to those end users, that will be um, channeled to another business, so it's a B2B relationship where you're driving some e-commerce to that other vendor. What are the models that are successful between the two businesses? <laughs> yeah, I'm just trying to make sure I understand the question. <laughs> I mean, if it's clearly you want to have a partnership, those are partnership opportunities, right? And, and you encounter that in every business, you know, where you essentially, you know, if you want to provide a complete solution, you actually need some other vendors. Now, for example, in property management, if you really want to have a complete solution, you better have some tenant screening where I can see whether a tenant will, before I actually get a tenant in during when they're prospect, you know? Um, the, the tricky part always from software as a service is if you try to integrate that and, and the other company is not very client-centric, but you are, then your negative things that they will do is really going to impact your own perception, right? And so you have to be really 
careful that you actually meet the same standards on that front. But uh, the other thing is that very often is, you know, these days it's the consumers or, the, or even the companies are very educated. They know that there's a choice out there, right? They don't necessarily like you locking into one specific solution. Okay, so if you say, oh, I will only work with that other secondary vendor, well, then that might not be necessarily great because they might want the choice out there, right? So, so very often as you just, have, and this is easy to do in the, in the, the cloud, you just provide an API Right, that you could have anybody tap into, and then you know you're independent of other partners, and you can say, hey, here's a choice that you could go to. And I'm sure the API concept you guys are using extremely lever you're mm -hmm. leveraging that. Right? Mm -hmm. I think the partner model is changing pretty substantially. Um, one of the reasons is, you know, I, I forgot the number from Microsoft. They have something like seventy thousand partners globally, and one of the reasons is when you're selling software that sells for a single big price up front, and a partner can get a commission on that, which is a chunk of a big price up front. You've got lots of motivation around that initial sale, uh, and of course there are many different kinds of partners and so on, but I think you see those VAR, you don't see VARs very commonly in the SaaS space. Uh, you see companies that help enable SaaS implementations, et cetera, maybe as, as what you do, but it's less common, and then on the partnership front, there's more kind of a, a cooperation as opposed to a reselling kind of model. Uh, Klaus is right, it, exposing APIs to your service and product just means that it's that much easier to let a thousand flowers bloom and let any company build something that utilizes what you do. Um, in some cases, end user customers do the same thing. It's not just partner companies. So APIs are a wonderful way of exposing the functionality. Uh, but as beautiful as the SaaS business model is, there are a few challenges in there. Yeah, I think I would just add to that a little bit. Um, Salesforce, and I use that a lot. We use Salesforce, obviously. I mean, we are a true cloud-based company. We launched our company last year. We have no servers. Um, every application we use is in the cloud. Uh, we have a lot of partners. And I think uh, what cloud communities know is allow us to collaborate with partners. So that it's a, so with the partner um, portal and Salesforce, um, it enables our partners to connect, share opportunities. Um, and so that, you know, imagine, you know, if today you were emailing someone about some idea or some project you might want to work on, but the ability to actually share information around an opportunity, um, think of a large, you know, uh, client we have today that's in the printing business. And, um, and they make printers, they're manufacturer printers. And, uh, and they're working on these large, multi-million dollar deals and, and delivering this equipment, but they have lots of different partners that might be bidding on that project. So they're able to enable or open up that opportunity for their partners now to, like, to collaborate and work with them through that deal process. And so very similarly, uh, we can do that you know, in a sales to for Salesforce to Salesforce type of connection, as well as a partner portal that, that enables that. And it's the API connectivity that allows that. It's, almost, it's like a service in and of itself. And Check so, out uh, yeah. my, I think it's my Starbucks or my dot Starbucks. It's actually Salesforce. Yeah. If you want to get an idea of something that's actually driven by the cloud, but it, it's, it's a complete Starbucks experience. So that little green plastic thing that goes in the hole of your coffee cup that keeps it from spilling, that came from the community, a Starbucks community in that, that application, all driven by Salesforce behind the scenes, but you, customers would never know that. I think what might be, uh, we have a really interesting experiment going on at, right now at the school where, uh, and it's akin to your question in that uh, we actually own systems that were purchased before the internet happened or shortly after the internet happened. And these companies have tried to adjust to the reality of that it is the predominant way that we compute now. And the interfaces to it are poorly designed. The, the end user experience is horrible most of the time. And a lot of times it doesn't work. There's a lot of effort that goes into delivering a pretty average experience. And then you sit around and you wait for your vendors to write a little bit better web interface and hope that your users like it a little bit more and you spend a ton of money on it. And it's just this cyclical bad experience that you spend a lot of your budget to replicate. There's a company actually just acquired by IBM a couple weeks ago. I think it's official now. We're uh, called Cast Iron. And what Cast Iron does, it's really interesting, is that we've got a legacy ERP system which hold the core information of, of the institution. 
And we have a lot of people doing who knows what with applications we don't even know about. And they're doing it because what we've delivered to them is just so poor, or we haven't delivered anything yet. So they went and buy, they go out and buy something or do it on napkins or in Excel or in Access. We got data everywhere and you get this data mess. Well, with cast iron, we can, we're working on writing actually an API in front of our ERP system. And then we can selectively work with companies that play in that rule space. So we've integrated Salesforce for our fundraising team uh, with an ERP system that was created well before the internet happened. We got two-way data flow, following business rules. And now we can go to end users and say, you know, in athletics, they want to track something with prospective student athletes. Great. And then so software as a service. Great. And we can rapidly do the MVP. I love that. Can I use that? Yes. And it's great. It's actually... It's, it's not yours? It's, no, it's not my turn. Oh, no, I thought it was yours. Not. That's just great. No, it's, uh, yeah, don't reinvent the wheel. Yeah. <laughs> do the MVP. Get it rolled out. Let people use it for 30, 60 days. Come back. Do iterative changes. And you hit a sweet spot that really matters to the end user. And the nice thing about software as a service, which we haven't mentioned, is the user experience is widely uh, adopted. You know, when we go with something from Salesforce or anything in a browser, people get it. And it's, it's an interface that they know how to use. Training goes down, support goes way down, things like that. That's all excellent, particularly when you have a staff that's, you know, filled with, with their time is filled up and you can't get them assigned to projects that are being driven by the institution or by a company. One of the great things about the internet is that it's a decentralized network. Um, but on one hand, you have cloud computing that gives entrepreneurs this ability to start up businesses without buying physical servers. But on the other hand, you have the servers are kind of being centralized in the sense that Amazon and Google own all the real estate hardware. Do you see a trend going back to kind of smart servers where you can kind of outsource a percentage of the CPU that you're not using into another database? Do you think something like that that's possible or are they already starting to do that as a replacement for the current cloud model. So um, I think that it's important to distinguish between when we talk about compute power or CPU cycles, it's important to distinguish at what level you tease apart applications or processes. I think it's unrealistic to take part of a program that's running here and split it off across the internet to run at another computer just because of the laws of physics of speed of internet traffic as fast as it is today is nothing compared to the, uh, local access from a CPU to a hard disk, et cetera. But you can certainly run separate applications when needed. And the concept behind that w is really pretty commonly these days called hybrid cloud. So in a hybrid cloud, you would use some external public Amazon, Google, IBM, Rackspace, whatever, resources for certain applications or certain transient uses of applications. So if the load built up very highly at the end of the quarter, end of the month for certain kinds of processing, you could use the external resources and then contract back in for other kinds of uh, applications that you might want to run on your own internal data center, maybe for security reasons or uh, just because for other, other design reasons. So that kind of hybrid model, we think, is something that uh, will, be, will continue to emerge. And in that sense, the public cloud was really the innovation, and it's pushing back into data centers through companies like Eucalyptus that Klaus mentioned. And the hybrid model, I think, at the end of the day, it's not really an either or. It's a driver for, if you buy the premise, as Klaus kind of showed with that increasing bubble graph, that the human race is going to consume more and more and more compute cycles over time, that has to come from somewhere. And the logical place for it to come from is externally with providers that can build out data centers at scale. It's pretty well documented that it's just more efficient from an energy management point of view, et cetera, from a density point of view. So the trend will be to outsource, but a hybrid model gives a nice evolutionary path to begin to consume more and more outsourced resources um, over time. 
once the transitionary phase is complete and cloud computing becomes uh, almost the default way for things to go, what, um, do you believe, first of all, that uh, cloud computing will completely overtake the present model uh, fully? And whether or not it does, what do you think the implications will be once the critical mass is reached for business and technology? I definitely think that it would become much larger than everything else. Um, I'm also know just from experience that old technology never dies. There are still mainframes around. Um, there will still be folks that will keep forever. That's why that curve, you know, the technology adopted curve, you will always have laggards. And there's even people today that don't use telephones, you know, and they probably write mail letters and that works just fine. Um, so I think you will always see old technology around. It's just the advantages, the efficiency that you can get, you know, it's just going to be to your favor. So if you adopt it, you as a business would be much more efficient, you know, and uh, and therefore I think that's clearly the future. I think this is also one where the consumer, um, a lot of people are talking about this consumerization of IT, really is seeing ahead of what, you know, the IT organizations are, they're adopting, you know, web-based emails, they're adopting smartphones, you know, there's like Lots of larger companies, you have a fight with, you know, and I, you know, Westman is very forward looking, but you have a fight with the CEO. I want to use an iPhone. They say, nope, you cannot use an iPhone. Yeah. And so, so that's why I think it's inevitable to be bigger than anything before. It's just one of those technology transitions that just happen and um, has lots of benefits. I would change the question just a slightly and, you know, put on my CIO hat. It's really all about strategy. Um, we all run, you know, important organizations trying to do work that matters. Um, cloud computing represents just a fundamental opportunity to embrace it in areas right now. And I love this evolutionary idea. There are things that we're just not ready to move into a cloud idea. It wouldn't be appropriate. We're taking very traditional paths in certain ways. But there are other things driven by strategy that it made sense to kind of risk on the cloud. It's an idea that's been around a long time. Um, it, it's kind of counterintuitive, but our data is more secure now. Uh, and I, I'll, you know, we'll, we could have that argument if it really is. And, and I can tell you, and I can't share too many secrets of what we're trying to protect and all of that, you know, because, but uh, it's a good thing for these areas that we've moved to the cloud for, for very much for strategic reasons. And as the cloud application space matures and different things are available out there, prices will continue to come down. And it, it's just gonna offer, I think, an untold opportunity for innovation. So as a CIO, as you look across your organization, say, how can we take technology and really put it in a place, uh, not just financially, but we want to run nimble organizations that can do very, very innovative things very, very fast because the pace of change and competition is just exponentially larger than it's ever been. If we're going to respond to that, IT can't take a year or two years to kind of deliver an okay solution. Uh, we've got to think, we've got to prototype, we've got to deploy, test, iterative change, and, and then we're, we're on to the next thing. And that's where I think cloud represents just a, for any vertical, any industry, is a, just a huge opportunity. And any CIO, it's well worth their time to begin to investigate, or maybe I can experiment here and there and see where it fits from, from my particular organization. You know, it's, it's, it's really interesting because going back to your question, if you think about, in class, what you said earlier about the consumer that really kind of drove innovation, really, um, if you think back in the late 90s, or early 2000s, when Amazon became who they are, and it was all about you know the, the single click, the book, well, that, that drove a, an enormous amount of innovation around building this platform where anyone in the world could order a book online. And when they did that, they had to build this massive infrastructure. And now they've taken that infrastructure and said, hey, wait a minute, I have all these computers sitting around. I'm not really leveraging all that compute power. What if I could take some of that storage space and create something that allows people to store their own data on. They can create their own storefront, and then they have, now they have S3. And then they took it to another, so say, hey, maybe I have some extra extra computer power around here. Maybe I could create this other idea and have computers that could, I could have end computers, right? I could, someone could go in and, and, and start, and just like RightScale, have this ability to have nth number of computers running to, uh, to manage their business, to, to scale. 
Um, I think about some of the projects I worked at when I was at IBM where we were building these huge servers for uh, the burst on NFL, you know, on Super Bowl Sunday. And to have something like Amazon uh, running now, you could easily scale for a billion, you know, views. So the consumer has really driven a lot of this marketplace. And what I think you're going to see now with, with this mobile technology is that companies like Cisco are going to start to have to build faster networks. We talked about the, 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 just the physical laws of the ability to write data from a computer to a disk. It's so much faster than going over to the internet. I think that you'll see that just like we saw in the local area network, that's going to transition, you know, gigabit speeds over the internet. The ability to, you know, we talk about the 4G network now. You know, I, in five years, it'll probably be the 10G network. You know, it's, those things are going to change the way that we compute. It's going to change the way that computing happens in the future. I, I just add one thing. This is happening like a brush fire. It's happening very quickly, although in an evolutionary way. A couple of statistics that are interesting. Uh, for, you know, the SMB market is obvious. If you're a startup, why would you invest in buying and trying to rack and stack servers and get them operational? For larger organizations, it's a different issue in terms of uh, you already have data centers, et cetera. Well, in the larger organization camp, um, Vivek Kundra, the federal CIO, has been a leader in pushing cloud computing. And there was an interesting statistic, a woman named uh, Christine blanking on her last name, but she's the CIO of the GSA, the Government Services Agency, in charge of all procurements for the government, so a big agency, did an internal audit and found out that 40% of the applications they run are lowest security level, entirely appropriate to move to the cloud now. So you're not talking about an either or situation, it's here's 40%, let's go now. It's low hanging fruit. Another great poster child story is the county of Los Angeles recently made a decision, some of you may know, to move to Google Apps, including Gmail. And this was a really interesting story because it's not only low-hanging fruit, they're actually, the, all the police email goes through their system. And there was a big debate around security, and uh, obviously Google got involved because this was going to be a great poster child win for them. And there was all this argument around, wait a minute, this is the police emails, what if the system gets hacked, left and right? And at the end of the day, they decided to go with the cloud-based system. And one of the quotes I just loved, the, the person who was responsible for operating this at the end of the day said, wait a minute, you're all talking about security, but day in and day out, we're working with a Pac-Man era email system. And we need something better. And that's, at the end of the day, what motivated the decision and the change. So it's happening every day as we speak, and it's amazing to watch this disruption just continue to flow throughout the whole IT world. Let's take one more. Okay. Yeah, this question is for Klaus. One part of your presentation focused on the team and what a great team you have. You also talked about the importance of being a flexible team you're looking for great people. If you could elaborate on some of the attributes you look for when you hire the people and what you look for in terms of how you want them to be flexible. Okay. Well, clearly, I, I think that one attribute that you always want is passion. You want people that are passionate about what they're doing. And, and so the way that we always like to say is we'd like to put a whole bunch of small teams together of people that really want to revolutionize markets. Right, so you want to really be part of that revolution, and and so you know you want people that get it, people that can really communicate well with other folks. You know, uh, ideally, people that have had some experience in what you're trying to do, or at least willing to learn quickly. Um, the reason why you need the flexibility is is that you can't really predict how the business is going to go, um, and uh, so that's where. You know, you just need folks that can say, yep, I'm going to do X today, I'm going to do Y tomorrow. Yeah. And it's just to kind of move as the, kind of the business shifts and we really figure out what, um, what the, the company needs are.